Three years ago this month, a group of us got together, a group of friends, many of whom are here, to sit around a table and envision what we could do to make local government work better for our residents. And with the help of our now 10 partner organizations and many of the lawmakers and public officials who are in this room today, we have made more progress than I could have uh, imagined, honestly. We do have more per capita in Illinois than any other state in the country. We actually don't know with scientific certainty what the total number of units of government is because there's no one uh, central reporting uh, system. We're working on changing that, um, but no matter if it's just below 7,000 or just above 7,000, it's a big number and it's a big problem. And this is oftentimes where our conversations start, right? When you talk to your neighbors, when you talk to your elected officials or your colleagues um, working to change this, we know how this plays out locally. Um, it makes our lives more complex. It makes delivering great services more complicated. Specifically, we drill down on per capita spending on a few single purpose governments, focusing on fire protection, parks and recreation, and library districts, all really important services. So what we found is that Illinois ranks first in per person spending in the sheer number of dollars spent. And in fact, local governments in Illinois spend far more than the 10 most populous states. So when we put ourselves in a comparison against the top 50, uh, of all 50 or the top 10, it is a concerning trend. Yesterday, we were at the National Association of Counties. We were giving a talk to a group of university deans and directors of uh, public service programs. And a woman from Wichita State came up to us after we talked, and she said, like, we just don't know what to do in Kansas. We, um, all of the local governments are struggling, and we're hearing this all over the country, local governments are struggling. Um, the local governments are struggling and we can't look to the state anymore. Our state is broke. So what do we that do? That may sound sort of vaguely familiar. <laughs> <laughs> We've been watching governments for 25 years and we really believe that change is possible, change is important. And I gotta say that what you're doing here and Transform Illinois and what we're hearing about Transform Illinois is exactly right. It's the way change happens is that people get together and they work on common problems and they work across jurisdictions. So let me uh, start with you, Lieutenant Governor, and just ask you to, if you would share with us, um, you know, you, you kind of took this show on the road as was previously described and uh, went around the state learning about efforts to, and, and challenges and obstacles to transforming government. You talked about a handful of the 27 recommendations being adopted. What did you hear out there that we all can maybe uh, take some tips from and learn about? Well, what I heard was that people are just tired of too much government. It's a turnoff. Uh, they want to save money. Not only do they want to save money, but they also want to see less government. They were explaining that they don't even know how many units of government represent them. For instance, in Wheaton, Illinois, where I'm from, 16 units of local government represent all four feet, 11 inches of me. And I'm sure the same holds true for each and every one of your communities. Not necessarily 16, but there's a lot of government going on. So people just wanted us to go on a big diet. Can you, I'm not sure your microphone is on. Can you guys hear her? Yes. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, and let me just stick with you in case you do need to duck out at some point and, and toss a few more questions your way. Um, we, uh, as we saw earlier, we had some really, truly fantastic progress this year with some um, significant pieces of legislation adopted. Um, are there uh, ways that we can make sure that the rest of the world out there knows what's available to them and can use those tools and, and what kinds of um, steps can we take now that we have those things uh, actually written into the law? Right, 
So initially when our task force began, we had 27 recommendations. We've seen six of those recommendations become law, and a lot of them were showcased before you uh, during previous uh, presentations. The way we could continue to be involved is that remember that we made 27 recommendations. We've only seen six become law. So there's a lot of work to be done. But during our course of traveling the whole state and gathering testimony uh, from units of local government, finding out where efficiencies could be had, we also discovered something very beautiful. It was units of local government telling us that they did not need Springfield to get in the way and that they themselves got together, entered into intergovernmental agreements themselves on their own power so that they could start sharing expertise, sharing equipment, sharing manpower, and that's in a way a sort of consolidation. That's a way we could start having that conversation. So in the Lieutenant Governor's website, you will not only see our task force report, which is the gift that keeps giving because we still have a lot of work to do in that regard, but you will also see our Journal of Shared Services and Best Practices. We update that journal every year. So if you folks want to find ways or have examples in your community to share with us, that's where we showcase it. And let me tell you right now, because we are in a fiscal crisis, people are hungry for this sort of information. Thank you. So are there um, you know, a few things that you really want to take from that report and work on in the next year? And, and how have you learned to kind of overcome some of the obstacles that you see government officials throw up sometimes because of ego and turf and, and worrying about their own uh, futures. Right. Well, change is, is tough, and a lot of people worry the minute that uh, we put the task force together. Uh, the first question that came up is, uh, so who's on the chopping blocks? Is it townships? Uh, is it uh, mosquito abatement districts? And so on. And the whole purpose of the task force was to create an environment so that if you lead your local government, you could take the initiative because the backdrop is already there for you to consolidate within your own power. As you previously heard, it's not a one size fits all. Consolidation is not good for certain units of government, but it's a perfect place for us to start getting together and having these conversations because already we're seeing consolidation occur. Chairman Franks. Are you going to pretend to be Sam Yingling while we have this conversation? I like your outfit today. I just want to <laughs> and you, sir, as well. <laughs> Do we share the same clothier, perhaps? No. Perhaps. So um, as everyone knows here, I'm sure you have spent a lot of time in state government and uh, decided to get the heck out of that town. and and uh, focus on McHenry County. What surprised you when you made that switch from state to local government? That's a good question. Um, I found that there's the sheer number of governments we were talking about. One of the things is it's impossible to know what's going on because there's just so many. Um, the, the individuals who are voting don't know who the folks are. The watchdogs don't know what's going on. And what you find is a lot of this just goes under the shadows. And there's been very little scrutiny of what's happened at, at local levels. Um, in McHenry County, we have, I think, 136 governments. Apparently, that's not enough. Um, and I can't also, and I'm looking at my friend Frank Haney here, who came in when I did. He's the chairman of, of uh, Winnebago. We're losing population. Um, in our areas, and the state is losing population, and a big reason is because of our property tax burden, and we have some of the highest property tax burdens in the country, and people are demanding that we end business as usual and to smash the status quo, and they are demanding that we consolidate and that we cut government. Um, that wasn't a big surprise. The big surprise I found was the reticence to that. Um, not only on the board for partisan reasons, but at the local levels. And I can, if you'd like, I can tell you a little bit about what's happening at the Lake and the Hill Sanitary District. Um, what, because of Dan's idea, we, we, we did the bill and the law, and the gov Governor uh, Sanguinetti and Governor Rauner have been champions on this. So when I, when I took this job, I said, I'm going to try to implement some of the laws we actually, we actually passed. It is almost impossible. Um, what they've done is when it's easy to create a government, but it's almost impossible to get rid of one. So Lake and the Hill Sanitary District is a small area. It has 11 square miles, and they're supposed to, you know, treat the sewage treatment, right? Even having the discussion of whether they would be a proper candidate for consolidation, 
I had to go to court to sue these guys because when, after I got elected, what they tried to do was to go buy land in Kane County, the neighboring county, miles away from where their district was. They could say they were in a second county, so the law that Dan wrote would not apply. And that's how desperate they were. And their point was they needed to protect the government. No consideration whatsoever for the taxpayers, but they wanted to protect what, what they've got going there. So I had to sue them, we won, and now we're gonna actually start the discussion to whether it even makes sense. When we're finally getting to step one, but it's taken me months to even get there. So that was a, a surprise of how, how much people cling desperately to the status quo. So one of the um, questions that I've thought about when I look at those laws that we achieved this year is um, how do you really get the word out to um, tax beleaguered taxpayers um, to actually go through this process in some cases that is very complicated as you just demonstrated? What tools are available to them and what do we need to do to kind of um, really follow up and make sure that some of those laws are known and are used. That's a really good point because I heard a lot from people who were against it and when I was trying to figure out who they were, I saw they were all related to the people who were working there. Um, so <laughs> insiders always have a really good resources to, 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 to try to fight you. Never underestimate you know, folks with spending taxpayer dollars to keep doing what they're doing. My solution has been to use the bully pulpit of my position as the chairman and just pound it through the press and then put it through social media and go to as many rotary clubs and stuff as I can to get the word out, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of work. And the opposition is just ridiculous in the, in the arguments. It's, it's, it's so entrenched. So it, it is really, it, it is difficult, but you have to just keep beating on it to get the word out. Do you find that, um as people learn about these things that are out there, that they're actually willing to take time from their own busy day, running the kids to dance and soccer and get to these meetings and kind of raise these concerns? People are really mad, yeah, but they're really disillusioned with our government. They don't feel as though their voices are being heard. Um, and I wish more people would show up um, we're working on that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a long slog. I think because of our reputation for corruption, and it's so richly deserved, um, we have a lot of people who are disenfranchised, and you see the, the low voter turnouts that we're seeing. I think that's a direct result. So to bring these folks back in, we have to show that we're willing to challenge the status quo. It's going to take a while, but I think we'll get there. So that's a, a great segue for me to turn to, to the next two gentlemen who have, in fact, uh, led the way and challenged the status quo at their local governments. Um, Montgomery, Mayor Matt Burley, how did you do what you did? <laughs> Where did it start and how did you actually knock down those barriers and get there? Awesome. So I'm assuming right now would be a really bad time to announce my candidacy for the sanitary district up there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. I'll hold off on that. Um, Probably the first conversation that we had that all local governments had after uh, you know, the, the crash was uh, we didn't have the revenues that we had before, and so we had to look for other ways to improve the service or at least continue the same level of service. And the first thing that comes to mind is our 911 dispatch. And we knew we couldn't continue to fund it ourselves, and the manager came and said, maybe we get out of that business. And we consolidated our 911, and uh, most of the residents have no idea that's happening. So with a lot of the things that we've accomplished, um, you know, the, the biggest one and the, t the highest priority for me is the uh, potential of us to join together for our water, uh, future water supply, which would be the Fox River as opposed to the aquifer. Um, very important to me as an engineer, but most of our citizens have no idea really what kind of um, cost sharing and staff sharing we're working on. Uh, but the, the first thing that you do is, is no shock to anybody, is talking. I talked to the, the mayor, and I sh I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, uh, you know, the support obviously has to come from uh, the Oswego Village President, Gail Johnson, and the, the mayor of Yorkville, Gary Galinsky. Uh, talk with them, have our staffs talk, have forward-thinking staff that looks into different ways, uh, and some really great things that we're doing right now together. So speaking of talking, um, you have an opportunity here to, with your index cards to ask these 
Transformers some questions while I'm asking them some questions. So if you uh, have anything you'd like to hear about, please do fill out your index cards and hand them down the rows and we'll pick them up and see how many we can get to at the end of this. Um, was there a point, Mayor, when you had to actually, you know, you, you shared some services and quit doing some things like the 911 um, service? Did you come to a point where you had to say to people, we don't need you anymore as a result of that? And how did you go about handling that situation? Yes, and that was one situation I think our dispatchers were very concerned about. Uh, we, we actually were very active in helping find them, um, you know, employment with, with uh, KENCOM, which is our 911 dispatcher, if we could, or other agencies, really. And that was an 18-month process, I think. So, um, you know, they had plenty of uh, headway on that. But that certainly is a, is a, is a huge concern there. Uh, one thing that I wanted to highlight about what some of the things we're working on right now is uh, our public works director, Todd Hoppenstead, has been very supportive of uh, looking for ways that public works can interact with the other agencies. And uh, just talking with their public works director one day said, well, we have this, you guys make the brine for, for snow removal, right, to spray on the streets, which everybody is doing now. It actually works really well because my parents now will see the stripes on the road and they know snow is coming in two days, uh, which helps, I guess. And... Uh, <laughs> And Oswego makes the brine, and Todd said, well, we just bought this fancy truck for spraying it. Why don't you guys make for everyone, and we'll spray your streets coming to and from uh, the village. And it's the openness to that conversation. And that's what we've been doing, I think, for two, two winters now. Um, that, again, residents really don't know that that's happening, uh, but it's, it's those kind of conversations that are really important. Any other, what are you working on next and any other tips for the, the local government people in the audience as to how, about, how to get after what you've accomplished? So the one thing that I touched on is that sometimes the answer is not um, feasible, right? So Oswego and Yorkville just hired a joint purchasing uh, staff member that didn't quite make sense for Montgomery. And I think being open about that doesn't really work for us. Uh, and they went ahead and moved Without, without us in that, but it's not poisoning the well. There's uh, some staff sharing that we're looking at with an IGA. Uh, let's say our building inspector you know, heads out of town for a conference or is, is off for an extended period uh, that we might be able to share their building inspector uh, so we can continue business as usual. So some great things, I would say just conversations at all levels are important. Communication, once again, I keep hearing that over and over and over again today. Um, Commissioner Frank, is that the proper way to refer to you? Any, anything you want. Hey, you. <laughs> All right. Um, what an amazing thing you accomplished in this past year, and uh, just the notion of union leadership cooperating with uh, the, the Fire Protection District Board and, and staff and management. Can you just kind of talk a little bit more about how you were able to get that buy-in and, and have that openness to, to do what you needed to do? That's a great question because uh, fire districts tend to have a municipal, uh, uh, almost a um, uh, military type uh, thought process behind it. Um, I noticed the stripes on the sleeves of the fire chief. I was a little uh, worried about right. well, whether I'd parked properly outside. And, that, and that's needed and because of the structure. If you think about it, residents call the fire department really in their greatest time of need. It's EMS, it's fire protection, and they're going through probably one of the worst events they'll go through in their life. So we have to be ready and we have to be prepared. So we really do a lot of planning and a lot of, um, uh, a lot of our uh, actions are to figure out what to do in the worst case scenarios. So when you go to make changes, you have to really do a lot of planning to make those changes. And I think the way that we started it was we started with grassroots, as I said, and that's getting labor involved. Because not only do we have the labor of the fire district, the Lyle Woodridge Fire District, but we have labor of our adjoining district, which is Darien Woodridge. We're unique because we serve not only Lyle, uh, Woodridge, and unincorporated DuPage, but then you have Darien Woodridge that serves a number of different um, uh, areas also. 
So it's a, it's a complicated uh, formula that you just have to start at the very basics by garnering support for the men and women who are providing the service. And I think that the, um, once you um, all define what the issue is, the problem is, you can all work together to s put together a solution. I think that's what we, we were able to do. Can you just dig into that a little bit more? Because I think that um, the whole notion of getting the union on board with this is something that a lot of people could benefit from. Right, it's, it's, it's difficult to, um, to uh, think that uh, you're a union member and you would um, uh, trans transgress through the ranks to um, certain levels and that maybe you're gonna change how that works because what we have now is we have members of our district riding on the other district's trucks. Their, tr their members are riding on our trucks, so we have to integrate, integrate uh, um, not only services, but the way we operate. Uh, it really started with an understanding that there is a need. Um, we did a strategic plan. The constituents brought in all of our constituents and stakeholders that we could to define what the problem was. And the problem was that um, there was an escalating cost of services. And we wanted to try to address how we could look at um, stabilizing those costs and getting economies of scale, whether it's the um, uh, joint purchasing program that we've uh, found has been very, very successful, uh, whether it's uh, looking at our, our partners, which would be our, our villages, a uh, village of Lyle, and their different taxing bodies. So when we went to look for outsourcing IT services, we talked to all of our partners. And I think that getting everyone involved in the conversation really helped, and it really creates efficiencies and an understanding of what everyone's trying to do. So you did this in one f first term in four years, which is really pretty incredible. So congratulations to you for that. Um, if you uh, had some advice or a handful of tips to offer people in the audience about how to replicate what you just did, what, what, what would you tell them? Well, it's perseverance, and I think what we talk about at our board is baby steps. You can't do everything all at once. You take uh, slowly take steps towards what you're trying to achieve, and it's got to be a win-win for all sides. It's got to be a win-win for our constituents, it's got to be a win for labor, and it's got to be a win for management in the district. So <clears throat> how did you... I'm obviously I'm fascinated by this. I hope you guys are too. How did you make it a win for labor? Well, showing labor that um, a sustainable district is in their best interests because the pension is funded through district funds. So if you um, model out what was happening, and this happens to, I think, all of our um, taxing bodies, is that we have this huge pension liability. Yep. It, you know, the way I look at it, I'm a banker by trade, and the way I look at it is if you go in the grocery store and you buy a gallon of milk and a box of cereal, you should pay for the whole thing, right? And what's happening is we're paying for gallons of milk from the 90s and, and, yeah. uh, and, and back. So you have to address that problem now. That milk's curdled, by the way. Yeah, it's, it's gone sour. <laughs> All right, terrific. Thank you so much. We have some um, questions from you. So let me run through them here. Cost savings, mergers, and unification seems to mean job cuts and layoffs, et cetera. How do you do this and uh, still preserve jobs and um, preserve employment opportunities for people? Maybe I could take that. We did have a reduction in staff, but the reduction was from uh, retirements. So we took that opportunity to re um, organize the department and to look at the ways we could g gain efficiency. So we do have a smaller department, but as you saw in the notes, we are still in ISO 1, which is the highest rating for a fire department. Um, there's not many of us in the state of Illinois, um, but we were able to do it with a reduced staff. And so it didn't affect people in their present day job, but we were able to use that attrition to affect that change. Yeah, by way of example, I believe the fire department in East Dundee and West Dundee, uh, one fire chief retired, so now they're sharing. So that's a good way to consolidate and not hurt any feelings, right? I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the question. I don't believe it's government's job to ensure government jobs, number one. 
Um, I think we have to look at efficiencies. Um, our technology is changing. I, I figure most of you don't go into your banks anymore to do your transactions. You do it on your phones. Um, so I presume there's less people working in your bank. Um, so government is not immune to the economic realities that everyone else faces. So number one, I would, I would disagree with that premise. Um, number two, I can tell you in McHenry County, I just presented my first budget and I've never gone through this before, but we are reducing our property tax levy by 11.2%. And we did it by, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I know Frank's working on that too, but we did it by looking at it differently, and we saw there's a lot of inefficiencies, and I think that we have to change how we think about government, and that's why we're all here. Give me a couple examples of the inefficiencies you found. I saw huge line items with big surpluses. I mean, it's always the CFO's job to do worst case scenario and always squirrel away money. And we had so much extra dough laying around for how we were going to pay stuff. We had a six-month um, reserve. I'm like, what are you doing? In private industry, we don't have anything like this. So I, I moved it from six months to 5.3 and freed up 7.5 million to use my capital so I could do capital projects with it. Um, I looked at, and some, the problem is you have these terms, if you have veterans in the line, for instance, it becomes a sacred cow and how dare you look at it, or if you have mental health. My God, you can't touch any of that. But they, some of these guys had uh, over a year's worth of surplus. So we were able to reduce their line items on property tax without affecting any of the services, without any cuts. And I can tell you one of the things I'm looking at is we have a, a nursing home which has a line item with $40 million surplus, which is enough to, for four years of operation if they get no money. Because like, why are we overtaxing our citizens? So we have to look at it differently. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next question from the audience. How did state or federal mandates affect what you've done, and do you have lessons learned from that that you can share? I'll take a stab on, at that because um, our task force not only concentrated on consolidation, but also on unfunded mandates. And we took testimony in that regard because really there's no true count as to how many unfunded mandates exist in the state of Illinois. So to take it into a personal uh, level, I used to be in the in the Wheaton City Council. And the big B in my bonnet was um, minimum manning requirements. And I felt that I did not appreciate that big government was telling little Wheaton um, how to man its fire station. We are 54,000 God-fearing residents, and we know how to man our own fire stations. So um, I think unfunded mandates are something that our task force report address. It's a big issue. It's a very young issue. And once we start getting rid of these duplicative unfunded mandates or the unnecessary ones, you will see the money come back into your communities that way as well. Anybody else want to hop in on that one? Sure. I, I can say one of the pressures we're having locally is the state just did a law that's going to take 2% from the, the collection of taxes. Right, yeah. I think it's egregious, quite frankly. It doesn't cost, I mean, the 2% is an arbitrary number. It's going to affect the locals. Um, if it's you an look ATM at, fee on yeah, local exactly, government. But, it's, but it doesn't have any reflection on what the, what the cost is to do this and for, and, for their, and for what they're doing. So talking about unfunded mandates, the state is guilty on the local levels as well. So we, there's nobody up here with clean hands, as we point that out. <laughs> All right. Uh, finally, with the variety of local governments, apples, oranges, and doorknobs, how do we craft legislation that will make it OK to consolidate without one triggering one-size-fits-all fears or two producing piecemeal laws? Great question. I'll take another one, only because this is something um, that we're working on in uh, my office. We're actually uh, working on a pilot program. It's going to be brand new. And uh, with Northern Illinois University and Dr. Norm Walzer, where are you? We keep on recycling you and using you. You better not ever retire. Um, but we're going to be uh, doing efficiency audits at the countywide level. And of course, it's not compulsory. It's a way for counties to come up to us and say, you know, let's do an efficiency audit. Let's see where the fat lies, if any, whatsoever. What are your recommendations? So I think this is a good way to start having that conversation. So stay tuned, because we will be showcasing that shortly. And if I can just follow up, I chaired the commission um, 
and then Evelyn had her commission, and yours was better. I want you to know that. Because we had buy-in from a governor who wanted to do it. And when I did it under President, uh, Governor Quinn, it, it didn't have that same buy-in. I came in with a bias when I chaired that first consolidation commission that I thought that we had to consolidate, and that was the only way. Learning from that commission, I knew that I, I was wrong. Consolidation isn't the only way. Cooperation, um, I think, probably works better. And I also found that we cannot mandate it from Springfield down. What we need to do is to empower the locals to make their own decisions, because there is no one size fits all. But we need to change our laws and our regulations to allow for local control. If we do that, it will happen. How about uh, Mayor and Commissioner, do you have thoughts on this as the people who are at that local ground zero? Yes. Um, probably one of the most obvious things is uh, getting local input, local buy-in from the residents that, that receive those services. So, you know, we don't have a mosquito abatement uh, district in, in, in our area. Um, Congratulations. And, but we do spray for <laughs> mosquitoes, which is... Uh, which is important, but uh, getting buy-in from the locals as to what they want their local government to look like, uh, and just the ability, uh, essentially the state and the, and the counties, to, to get out of the way if that's what our residents choose to do, uh, to consolidate, which might not be consolidation, it might be cooperation, but people want us to do more, uh, improve our level of services at, with less money. And so that's the constant uh, conversation that we have. And I think the thing that all of us are trying to do is that outreach and how do you reach all of those citizens? How do you deliver your message and solicit input? And I think the web has been a great thing for us. We've tried to be transparent. We, uh, as an example, we used to get FOIA requests for salaries for our staff. We have, used to have to pay to print them annually. Well, if you put them on your website, uh, you don't have to pay to have them printed. It seems like a, a small cost, but every little bit helps. So. I think the, using that outreach is really a, a great tool for everyone in government, and I think it helps the citizens understand uh, what your mission is. Terrific. Thank you all so much, and congratulations again to, to each of you and your achievements.